Hello learners, welcome to the Economic Geology course. It is an advanced course for geology graduates which aims at helping the learners to understand basically how the mineral industry works, what aspects of geology, economics, exploration and mining a student of geology must have in order to perform well in the industry or academics or research and development. I will also try to impart certain practical aspects skill sets through this course that are essential for a mental exploration geologist. As you can see, the course is uh, divided into four major units, each of which contains two subunits. The first unit deals with understanding why we need to study economic geology, what is the need of it, how a study of economic geology is going to help me or help you in fact to work for the cause of the betterment of the society. The unit is divided into two subunits. The first is the mineral resource crisis and the second subunit is the role of geology in averting this crisis. And the second unit is uh, discussed as geological theories pertaining to the genesis of old deposits. The second unit deals with general mineral laws in India and few other selected countries. The second part of the second unit deals with mineral economics. The third unit is single unit. It's a large unit dealing with various aspects of mineral exploration. As a student of geology, it is mandatory that you must be aware of these techniques involved in the resource exploration. The last unit deals with mineral exploitation and sustainable mining techniques. That is a brief introduction to the course and now we move on with the first concept of this course that is mineral resource crisis. <clears throat> so before we begin the crisis, let us understand what is a mineral resource or a deposit means. To simply put, mineral resource or deposit is an unusual concentration of minerals in an otherwise usual rock that is the earth's crust. For example, the Earth's continental crust is generally made up of rocks that are granitic in composition. An anomalous concentration of chalcopyrite within this granitic crust makes it a mineral deposit or a resource. Now, what accounts for anomalous concentration? We'll try to answer this question in the coming classes when we actually deal with the geology of the old deposits. In fact, the granite itself is loosely considered as a mineral resource since it is widely used as construction or used for construction purposes. <laughs> you know, our civilization is based on uh, mineral resources. Most of the equipment that supports a modern lifestyle is made up of metals and powered by energy from fossil fuels. The machines that we develop to transition us into a renewable energy future are also made entirely of mined materials. Our dependence on minerals pervades a society. It is like we cannot survive without minerals and managing their flow is a major challenge to society. Believe it or not, large-scale production of food for growing populations depends on mineral fertilizers. The buildings in which we live and work are made almost entirely of mineral material and even the gems and gold that we use for adornment and to support global trade come from minerals. It is interesting to note that most of Earth's 7 billion inhabitants are actively seeking the comforts that mineral consumption can provide. If global population and affluence continue to grow as rapidly as many estimates suggest, the pressure to find and produce minerals will be enormous. Although the magnitude of our growing demand is easy to see, we have become dangerously complacent about it. The most fundamental generic issue facing the mineral sector is the question of physical availability of metal from the earth. You see the apocalyptic views first expressed in 1798 that the physical limits of some metal and mineral resources are fast approaching have recently re-emerged. In actuality, despite increasing metal production over the past 50 years, reserves have remained largely unchanged. 
concerns over physical exhaustion may be based on an over simplistic view of the relationship between reserves and consumption that is the number of years supply remaining equals reserves divided by annual consumption so basically it goes like this uh, number of years supply remaining will be equal to reserves divided by and no consumption this is the formula used to calculate the the supply supply efficiency uh, metals of which we know the precise location tonnage and which we can exactly extract these metals economically with existing technology is called basically as reserves and these reserves are tiny in comparison to the total amount consumption and reserves change continually in response to scientific advances and market forces so the reserves does not remain constant it changes and it is directly proportional to the consumption and both of them continually changes in response to the scientific advances and market forces that are in existence i'll give an example uh, between 1900 and 1973 1973 world oil consumption grew by more than 7% annually with each succeeding decade using about as much oil as had been consumed throughout all previous history world oil supplies were set to be on their way to exhaustion by the turn of this century with steel aluminum coal and other commodities following similar trends it appeared that we were about to witness the end of a brief mineral using era in the history of civilization but did it happen now so why is that explorations stimulated by predicted mineral shortages fanned out across the globe dramatically increasing reserves for most mineral commodities in fact production increased so much that it created a glut of minerals on world market thus just when we were supposed to feel the cold breath of shortages and rising prices the world saw an excess of mineral supplies and plummeting prices unfortunately this respite was very brief can you guess why you see although increased reserves came as a relief it brought in severe problems related to environment effects that were once local in scale have become truly global with mineral consumption implicated strongly in problems ranging from global warming and acid rain to destruction of the ozone layer and pollution of groundwater just when we need to expand mineral production there is a concern that earth is reaching its limit of mineral related pollution only a short time ago our mineral supplies were determined largely by geologic engineering and economic factors their relation to earth's mineral endowment was usually depo- depicted as uh, shown in this particular figure you can see uh, that most important part of the mineral endowment consists of the reserves material that has been identified geologically and that can be extracted at a profit at the given time that is what accounts for this uh, reserve base whereas the resources includes reserves plus any undiscovered deposits regardless of economic or engineering factors you can see on the y axis you have economic engineering and there is one new factor added perhaps uh, a couple of decades before that is the environmental factors and in the x axis you have geological 
factors. The cumulative production can be considered as economic, marginal economic, sub-economic, depending upon these two parameters. Now we must ask not only whether the deposit can be extracted at a profit but can we also do it in a way that does not compromise the quality of our planet. See the government regulations and public opinion which you are going to see in the coming sessions are the added constraints on our ability to supply society with the benefits. Thus, the nature and extent of our global mineral endowment is no longer controlled strictly by market forces and administered by mineral professionals who make decisions on the basis of geologic, engineering and economic factors. Instead, it is in the hands of a broader constituency with a more complex agenda focused largely on the environment or environmental factors, but with additional concerns about distribution of wealth. In addition to this new constituency threatens to push the challenge of supplying society with minerals into the realm of wicked problems, those in which there is a lack of certainty about how actions are related to outcomes and where there is much debate about the relative values of the